All right, let's go. Steve Azuski in the house in Pleasanton. Yes. How's everything going, man? <laughs> After meeting you just a week ago, we're here in lovely little uh, the little village of Pleasanton. Although it's not much of a village, all the rich people live here. Yeah, that's true. And I would say it was a nice break for the holidays, but man, it is busy again. Everything. <laughs> I feel like this week, everybody's back to full speed. So. Well, you know, first off, thanks so much for taking the time. But secondly, I got to dole out some congratulations because I think you were just mentioning a nice press release from our, your, your friends at Nudge, right? Yes, yes. And so Russell over at Nudge uh, asked me to be an advisor for the company. And so he was gracious enough to offer. And I was, you know, honored to be able to say yes. Nice. Well, I mean, I know you went from being in a bunch of CISO roles. You were in Levi's for a while, right? Yep. And then post Levi's, you went into just let's move into more advising. Yeah. Working with new people, seeing what's new. Yes. Nice. Well, one way to look at it that way or what I said was, look, there's there's larger systemic problems in security. Right. And to be an operational CISO allows me to address a set of them. Mm -hmm. There were just other things that I wanted to go after, which is why I, you know, basically say at this point as an executive advisor, really my time is to go after some of the larger problems and be that connector and talk about the problems and what we have to do to fix them as a security community. Got it. Because most of the time, well... I think one thing that's interesting is the people that build the products are not necessarily the people that use the products, technically speaking, right? And so if we think about it from that perspective, you were using the products, may not necessarily mean that you're the right person to build the products, but you can definitely tell people what's wrong with what they have. You know what I mean? I can do that or picking the investing in products, right? Because you look at the investors and you're like, well, the investors have some skin in the game, but mm -hmm. they've got their own set of requirements. Then you look at the analysts. And the analysts have kind of their own view of the world. Right. And when you look at it from a community, what I say is, hey, look, everybody knows that it takes a village to raise a child. We've heard that before, right? True, true. Well, if you apply that to the security community, mm -hmm. right, the way I look at it is all the children are all the companies that we're trying to protect. Right? Yeah. And we have a common enemy that's trying to work through the village to be able to attack all of our children. It is villagers we spend more time fighting with each other rather than understanding how to work with each other, realizing we have a common enemy. Okay? I, there. And so that was my whole point was, well, everybody in their own view thinks they're doing the right thing. But in aggregate, what we're doing is letting the bad guys through more and more, not less and less. Mm. So let's have that conversation around what it means to stand shoulder to shoulder and look at how as a community we actually improve our ability to stop the common enemy. That's what you know. Common enemy. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, that's true, right? Because I think like it is a, there is a security industry, let's call it, right? It's no longer just, hey, there's a few things here and there. I mean, the RSA conference is massive. Like yes. really, really, really massive. Yes. And when you think about how big that is, there's just a lot of people that could benefit from more direct, more particular knowledge about, well, this is what kind of, help me at a, a Levi's, for example, and this is what can help me in the future as well. Okay, and so now you use the magic word help, okay? <laughs> now, there are about 4,000 security companies out there right now, so I got 4,000 companies all tapping me on the shoulder saying, I'm here to help me, okay? <laughs> but in reality, while that might have been true 10 years ago, I don't need 4,000 companies worth of help, mm -hmm. and most of them aren't here to help me. They're here to sell me a product. Yes, right. like me. I love selling people products. There you go. It's the best so thing. You want to stand behind me, tap me on the shoulder, whisper in my ear, and then when the bullet comes, I take the bullet, then you move on to the next customer. Uh-oh. Okay? That's not working anymore. <laughs> and I, you got, that show's you over. you got to stand next to me now, okay? <laughs> you got to be able to demonstrate that you're going to own one of my problems and you're going to take the bullet if you don't succeed. And that transition is one that we're starting to acknowledge and you see it, mm -hmm. but the industry is not wanting to take that responsibility where the CISOs are now starting to enforce that. Because they want to make sure that they, I mean, I, I remember uh, a few, few, few guests ago, yes. uh, there was someone that got ripped off by a company, a cybersecurity company. Because I mean, really, when I say ripped off, it's like, look, you were buying something, 
it didn't work properly and therefore you just lost hundreds of thousands yeah. a, m- a year basically in big company right so in the realm of that i guess you're thinking look that's not allowed anymore that shouldn't be allowed well it's not that it shouldn't be allowed to get back to what is what is our responsibility to mm-hmm. each other right yeah. because security really is a community right we talk to each other we trust each other our reputation speak for each other and so we're simply saying we have to get better at that now and so if you're going to come in and just try to sell me a product i'm like look selling security is not like selling sneakers right right right, right. you can't just sell the sneakers and expect to walk away there's a consequence here yeah and like i used to say at levi's i would look to the security vendors and i'd say how does what you do sell more jeans because my job at levi's right was not to secure the company mm-hmm. it was not to protect the business it was to sell more jeans and so therefore how am i enabling the selling of more jeans right and if you're impeding that or causing a problem or even if it's in general causing more headaches than smiles <laughs> that it's a problem which by the way uh is it, it's not like that's like not the brand identity of levi's right levi's if we think about the 18 18- 76 uh, gold rush and everything like that or was it 49 uh, 1849 1849 sorry so sorry so sorry <laughs> 49ers <laughs> my bad uh, 1849 uh, you know that uh, the quality and assurance and thought process and just the ability to make denim that's what defined Levi's as a whole yes that's where we came from but now it's women yeah. selling jeans to women well, now 200 years later, there's so much more, uh, you know, of a thought process that goes behind it. I mean, obviously there's a cybersecurity angle and everything like that, but uh, I agree, you know, you have to be able to do the business. This is all in service of making the business work the way it's supposed to. Right, and, and what, I, what I say oftentimes now is it's about brand. It's about trust and brand to now, right? Yeah. So yeah. if you damage the brand, that is not acceptable. And so if security, is damaging the company's ability to sell by introducing too much friction or slowing the company down to be able to adapt to sell more jeans Mm -hmm. have we done our job well you sell more jeans that's better which by the way i think you are wearing levi's right now (laughs) absolutely for everybody that knows i didn't realize when i retired from levi's that i was going to be a brand ambassador for levi's for the rest of my life which what is you say? when they know that you worked at Levi's and I'm wearing a nice pair of pants at a business meeting, I get called out, which is how come you don't wear Levi's <laughs> jeans? So, again, I speak to the brand. And if you do it right, which was I pretty much get to wear jeans for the rest of my life because I am a brand ambassador, whether I like it or not. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big believer in brand. Right. So when I talk about dope security, I always say it's a brand and there's a choice of brands. You can go in. And you can get something that's more old school, that's 10, 20 years old. But this is what you're missing, right? You're missing this focus on, as, as dope, we focus on passion. Passion, user experience, design, and especially the quality and the micro detailing of making sure that when you use the product, it will work. And we've gone in and done that on your behalf. That's the idea. Yes. And when we talked about that, remember what I said too, which was, it's one thing to be passionate about executing flawlessly Mm -hmm. at the problem you're solving right but what the overlay is is look as a as a CISO right we're in a war right the bad guys are attacking us what we want to see in that flawless execution is actually an appreciation that you understand the war through our eyes Mm -hmm. and you realize that you're in it with us yeah not that you're just doing a good job at your part of the problem I I think it's like important to have this the 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 skin in the game the thought process really just the responsibility and you know a lot of people when i started uh dope security there's a lot of questions people ask they're like one you know (laughs) uh like what's going to be different about it and when we start to explain that everyone got pretty excited about that but two they're always like why are you always dressed so nicely and formally and i'm like well (laughs) i I will (laughs) tell you you definitely you know set a fashion style and it works for you i will say i i I find it so important when you go into a meeting with a customer you don't know how like for some companies the cyber security angle yes it is it is it critical to business sure you know we need to make sure it works but if something happened if a virus got on a system 
uh, on, a, on someone's laptop and they weren't able to work for the day, the world would not end, right? But you don't know that, right? Every company is different, every employee is different, every person is different, and therefore, like when you come to the table, you should be serious, you should have integrity, honesty around how you're doing what you're doing. I never lie about what we have in our product. I always just tell them very straightforward and honestly, even where you're going, right? Because you don't want people to think that you're doing something that you're not. And that is what I used to see before in other companies. That's, but that gets back to what, what we were talking about here, which was you are owning the problem. Right. Okay. You are coming to me and say, I see the world through your eyes. This is the problem that I'm going to take off of your plate and I'm going to own. Mm -hmm. And the, the respect and the polish and the presentation and the commitment, that is your brand as to how you represent that for me to trust you. Fair, very fair. And I think that one thing that I've always felt from you, at least when we first started talking, you were like, well, Kunal, you want to do more with more, <laughs> more with less or less with less. And I always found that so interesting when you said that because there's a lot of reasons. I mean, you know, these sayings and thought processes, they always made different things. So tell me, like, what exactly was that? Sure. So, so when I position that, right, it, it's, an, it's one, when I said that to you and to many people, what happens is you automatically interpret that statement mm -hmm. and then it, it's a non sequitur for you. You're like, wait a minute, that, that doesn't make sense, especially when I go, the answer is do less with less. Right. Okay. And people are like, what? It's security. We have to protect everything. And the, the conversation behind that or the learnings is, hey, look, for five, seven years, we've got lots of money, right? Lots of people for the security teams. What did we commit to do? Stop the attack. Have we? Yeah. Not so much, right? And so, therefore, our ability to keep going asking for more, mm -hmm. so do more with more, we've kind of run out. Yeah. So now we end up with the, well, now we have to do more for less. Yes, the credit card is over the limit. Well, credit card is over the limit. And so now in a recession, and now that our reputations with our executives isn't as stellar as it was, we have to do more with less. Mm. Well, that's a drive to be able to say, let's be more efficient. Right. Okay? So in order to be able to do something new, it means I have to find the money from my existing to be able to do something new. Got it. Okay? And I hear that too. But what you're seeing more and more is to try to do more with less, mm -hmm. there's only so much you can squeeze out of that orange, okay? And they're gonna just keep squeezing you. So my whole point was, well, wait a minute, time out. If I can't keep going with more with less, I have to go less with less, which means I have to understand what parts of the company truly are important to the company. Right. And spend my limited dollars and resources to truly understand the business impact analysis and be clear on what part of the companies I have to have strongly protected and which parts can I do less. Right. Okay. So that actually forced a better business conversation where now I was working with the business to understand where is it that we made money and where is it that our brand can be damaged to get an extinction level event like consumer data. And let's focus on those areas and where are the areas that aren't as important. Makes now, sense. All right? of a sudden now you're having a business impact analysis conversation, not a security protection conversation, yeah. right? And the way I say that too is I go, look, is our job to do risk management or risk reduction? That's where uh, some people look at it as a risk reduction exercise, but I think you'd probably have a risk management purview, right? Well, and I go look at all the CISOs who think their job is risk reduction. It's to drive risk as far down as they can for the entire company by putting as much security friction into the business process as necessary. <laughs> well, that only goes so far. Right? Yeah. And when you and I were talking, what we realize is that business friction is a negotiation we have to have, mm -hmm. okay? And the way to be able to have that negotiation then is to understand which parts of the business do I truly have to lean in on to understand how much friction I have to do and where can I back off because it doesn't make a difference. Fair. But I think this process, I mean, it takes a lot of time to think in this mentality, right? I mean, you can't just say it. You have to actually do it. Um, and I think it's kind of similar to how on the product side, um, there is 
like that that mentality has to be put in uh, to to the products as well, right? I mean, yep. if you if you take the same thing and you're doing it slightly uh, more e efficiently, I heard that you don't like that as much. I think you like it to be more effective. Well, so here, this again, it gets back to the measurement versus metrics. Okay, so if I am trying to keep my job mm -hmm. and I'm going to find some efficiency to save 5% or 10% out of my budget. Yeah. Awesome. And I can show you some measurement that I'm being more efficient. Okay. But what is my job? Is my job to try to do most efficient or is my job to stop the attack? Is my job to be able to actually demonstrate how effectively I am addressing the key attack vectors and I'm stopping the attacks on the company that can put us out of business. Not that I can do security awareness training $50 cheaper. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it is a mentality change, even, I mean, even for me, right? When, when you're building a product, you think so much about how do I go and take this customer and plug this issue? But sometimes, what the first part you said is like, look, sometimes you just can't have 20,000 products in your own company. Every like company like Levi's can only have a certain set of security products. And after that, it's like, look, this is too much. Right. And so do less with less, <clears throat> if you think about it too, is in essence saying, what's good enough security? Right. It's changing the, the paradigm of having the most mature security program you can have to lock down your company, to look at it from a business value proposition, which is what is good enough for my company at this point in time, given these circumstances, knowing that it's gonna to change tomorrow. And if I take that and then cross hatch that with effectiveness, not just efficiency. Correct. Because I think those things, they, they, they do work really well together. I was, again, I was thinking about it so much because so much of what I like to do uh, from a product, building the product, and our team in general, right? We do want the product to work, but what does work mean? It means that it actually is effective at what it's supposed to do. It's not just faster. Okay, fine, you can click things faster, but it actually does solve the problem full stop. Right, and another example I would use <clears throat> when I talk with my peers and mm -hmm. you, right? Which was, let's talk about vulnerability versus exploitability. Right. Vulnerability management for a lot of CISOs is, I've got 10,000 vulnerabilities for assets. Okay, can you manage a 10,000 vulnerability problem? Not effectively. Right. So if I can knock down an extra 50 vulnerabilities and patch 50 more mm -hmm. over the 100 I could do, then I get it down from 10,000 to 9,850, okay? What have I really accomplished? Whereas if I say, let's look at the exploitability. Let's look at not all 10,000 vulnerabilities to patch, but which ones are critical for how a bad guy is going to likely attack me and get to a material exploitability that's gonna damage me. Right. And now let's look at that and understand how I can thwart the attack. Well, now I don't have 10,000 vulnerabilities that I'm just chasing. What I'm doing is understanding which of those vulnerabilities taken in the right order and how do I disrupt an attack and what would that look like? And now maybe that's only 100 vulnerabilities max that I have to address because I'm understanding what the exploitability looks like and what I'm doing to thwart. Mm -hmm. Very different way of thinking about it, and that's in essence efficiency versus effectiveness. Right. Let's get to what we're wanting to be metric for, not metrics for. Mm -hmm. Okay? friend of mine loves... I mean, because everyone works in a different area. They have their own specialties and stuff like that. So you have to, I mean, for example, I don't regularly use a VM tool technology, mm -hmm. right? I've only used it once or twice. But yeah, I've seen the Nessus agent and things like that and how they've gone in and, and done this stuff. And so I've, I've kind of adopted the viewpoint that there's like kind of these franchise, big, bigger sort of area cybersecurity technologies that everyone should sometimes use. But one of the things that we saw is that like, uh, just last week actually, is that like 10 years ago, that was Semantic McAfee for an AV endpoint. Yep. And now it's CrowdStrike Sentinel-1. So you've been in doing this for a long time. What do you think of that? 
So this is an example where you use some technologies and companies, okay? I take a step back and I go, let's think about what we've just said here, which was how do we put a protective perimeter, mm -hmm. okay, or bubble around this? And I go, historically, right, what we did was we looked at the network edge. How do I protect at the network edge? Right, and from your company out. From the company out, right? And then how do I, at the endpoint, simply stop a malicious uh, executable from executing? Right. Okay, and you go, that's what we did. Mm -hmm. That was the whole world. Yeah. And that was what you just said. Well, now, if you're thinking about this, our service edge has gotten more complex. We have a network edge, we have an identity edge, Mm -hmm. And we have a data edge. Yeah. So files are no longer files, it's data, structured, unstructured, everywhere. And so now what we're trying to say is, well, given that I have a network edge and an identity edge and a data edge, what is the right combination of tools to be able to understand, given those service edges, that is an appropriate level of protection for my company in my circumstance? And that for a startup like 100, 200 people, or even 10, 20 people is obviously gonna be very, very different for a 20,000, 30,000, or even a Levi's, I'm not sure how many employees there were there, but that many people organization, everyone is different. Absolutely. And now you're seeing the rub, which was, we all wanna be able to simply go to the cookbook, mm -hmm. okay, and open it up and find for our case. But unfortunately, the word snowflake, I hate to say it here is, most every CISO is a snowflake and most every company is because we're still so early on the cybersecurity journey that we haven't reached that level of maturity that we know how to pick that there's only one of 50 or 100 different recipes from. And so now you get to this situation where I as a CISO, how comfortable am I at being able to describe what my perimeter is and what risk framework I want and how I'm gonna represent that to my executives when I'm not clear on how to do that and mm -hmm. the executives aren't clear on what good looks like. Yeah, well, there's a, you remind me so much of music, right? Because in, in music, like you can either be Taylor Swift, crushing it, uh, queen of the pop music all over the, like really, really has done an amazing job. And then you also have like artists that may not be that big, that, but they, they've really conquered their genres. Yep. And success is equal in a lot of ways, in both ways. Like you, success, you can't obviously make completely equal, but you can be uh, the, the, the queen of pop, or you can be uh, the, the, the king of a small, uh, of your own genre. And that's really, really good. As long as you can be the best and solving and helping these customers or helping them, partnering with them to make a better solution. Okay. so. This is when I get back to the, the conversation is what's good enough, okay? It's not being the best because there's no best, okay? I can't, here's the thing, no matter how good I am, we are gonna be attacked, okay? So in essence, one of the things I need now, if you think about it is for everything that I do, I've gotta be able to address first line of defense. Yeah. I have to be able to address last line of defense and then I have to be able to demonstrate evidence of defense. And that's really my job now, is the impossible happens every day. So I can't just totally try to prevent everything. Well, I definitely don't mean best. I'm just trying to look at it from the perspective of, look, there's ways of building a product in a specific area, building a solution. Either it's gonna like do very well, that's what makes, that the excellence is what we want to achieve from a product perspective. I can tell you, like, no, anyone product manager worth their salt, they want to make sure they make the best possible product. Now, that may not be, the, it may be good enough, fair enough, like that's fair, but they still want to be the best at what they do. That's what drives us as people. Yes. And so, I'm, uh, it, and I didn't mean to, to push back at best, but you see now how we can talk about wanting to be the best at what we do, whereas we have to be the best we can be mm. where there is no 100%. Right? Yeah, we yeah, it's, it's a different, there. there's it's a, a different finish line for yes. everything, yes, yes, yes. exactly. And I, I guess that's where with security, what we're saying is we want to be able to consider ourselves like finance, right? Where we have all the rules and everybody knows how to do it and everybody's done it a long time, but we just haven't. And so therefore, oftentimes we just are put in situations where 
we have to be comfortable with making decisions mm -hmm. that are far from optimal, but they're actually good enough and the best that we can do. Right. 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 And see how you, that, that softening of the conversation is very difficult because that's not how executives want to be told. <laughs> give me a problem, give me an answer, and tell me exactly how much it's going to cost to make the problem go away. Which makes sense, right? I mean, I, I like go away. I, but I agree with what you're coming from because there is there is like a nuance to it, right? And not, uh, I think, really this stems into what would be the advice that you would give to uh, to your companies? Like you give them, like what is the number one thing you tell people? Because you talk to a lot of cybersecurity companies now. Yeah, and so what I tell them is don't come and tell me you're here to help me. Okay, show me that you're going to own one of my problems. And if you expect me to hear, listen to what you've built and try to figure out which problem it is that I'm going to solve, those days are over. Right. There's an expectation that you need to understand how to be a CISO first now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And what I say at that point is, so please don't marry the technology Mm -hmm. marry the business problem. I mean, I think really what you're saying is that as a person that's driving a product roadmap or a person that's building a company around cybersecurity, you have to be a CISO persona. You have to be able to embody that uh, very, very well. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to really grok the whole problem. And you have to be very succinct. Like when I will sit with you, when we talked with you, right? I said, look, you have four slides in 12 minutes to yeah. make it crystal clear to me what the brutal truth is, what part of that brutal truth you're solving, and also everything you're not doing, okay? Which flies in the face of how you traditionally want to be able to try to sell your product. Right. And so, but that is the honesty that you have to bring to the equation because I can't talk to 4,000 companies, right? You have to be more honest with me to be crystal clear on the business problem that you're solving so that it's interesting to me and then eventually it will become important. But you can't mandate that what you're doing is important to me. And that seems to be something that a lot of the salespeople and the founders really struggle with. They force the problem down your throat. <laughs> well then tell me, what is it that made you like dope security then? Um, so because what I talked about earlier was, look, security is a community. And so now it's about trust. Mm. Okay. Now it's about commitment. And so when I talked with you and I talked to dope, right, it was very clear that what you said is we're proud of what we built, but more than proud, we committed to building something that works. And if it doesn't work, we own it. Right. Okay. And then what I marry that to is what business problem are you solving, okay, so that we marry the commitment to excellence with the commitment to being there for your business partner. Right. Okay. And that blending is why I simply said you get it. Oh, man, I appreciate that. I think, I think it comes from, like, the people around you, you know. I mean, everyone, when I was learning so much from my own obviously managers and, and and so on and so forth everyone used to say like exactly in what you're saying but in a different in their own in their own words right hey how do i how can you focus on on solving the problem okay don't build something that's going to be a one-off a very simple example don't build a one-off product why because if you build a one-off product then you're always going to be tied to the hip to that one customer you can't go to anyone else and therefore eventually especially in a larger company that product or company ceases to exist. Yes, and the other thing I would tell founders, like you know, we and we talked about, which was, so your job is to analyze a set of problems and come up with a solution. Okay? Right. And then you build the perfect hammer, and you're proud of it because you talked with me, you understood. You give me the hammer, okay? And then the first thing I start to do is I abuse the hammer and don't use it as a hammer, I use it as other tools because I'm in circumstances where this is what I have and this is actually a good way to do it. And then you get mad at me because you go, no, 
use it as a hammer as opposed yeah. to what you want to do is understand how I abuse it and then reflect that better into the tool. Right. Okay? So now all of a sudden it's a hammer and it's a wrench and it's a pry bar and that's what you want to do. And so what we say too is you're doing the best you can to understand our problem and you build the tool for that. But then when you give it to us, watch how we use it and reflect that back in, into the into tool the product, to understand what we're doing. Oh, of course, of course. You know, there's so many technologies and, and, and telemetry that you have now, especially because you're using like a cloud console or this or that. You can see how is the customer using it? How are they enveloping it? And, and put it back into a feedback into the product without even really just having to have a conversation, right? A lot of that is, is, is constantly recognizing how someone is using what you're using. But we are getting to the coffee shop here in there a second. We We're, We're almost doing back. Good. That's okay. but, We're having fun. But I gotta know. So what, uh, what is like the last thing you'd want someone to know? Because you're now, I mean, you're an advisor. Uh, really, that's your full-time job, right? Advisor, investor, mentor. So fix some of these underlying problems that we've been talking about for the last 25 or 30 minutes, right? Yeah. Because look at the security village and let's figure out how we collaborate better and do the right thing against the common enemy. Absolutely, absolutely. And most importantly, if you can, be as involved as pro in the process. And I think you said this best is that be a player on the field, not just kind of watching from the stands, right? Yes. So advising and security is a contact sport, okay? And if you're not willing to get in there, okay, then I don't need yet more <laughs> Monday morning quarterbacks. But I'm going to leave you with this, okay, which was, and I, again, I say this as a point, was what is the number one metric, security metric, that every employee absolutely will pay attention to? That every single security? No, I say, so we understand measurement and we talked about metrics, mm -hmm. okay? And I go, so what's the number one security metric that I guarantee that every employee will pay attention to as to wanting to be able to do better with security? Well, you got to tell me. <laughs> if I take a wild guess, I'm not sure. I think there's so many different things, but sometimes I also think it's not necessarily just one number. I think it's a combination of different things, but what do you think? Okay, and very reasonable way to approach it. What I say is the number one metric is how does this security control impact the likelihood that you're going to get 100% of your bonus? <laughs> well, with that, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Good to see Good you. Hang out too. again. Yeah. Take care. That was awesome. Thanks so much.